We're delivering the Shahid Anwar Memorial Lecture for the year 2019. In fact, when I got the invitation to do so, I was a bit surprised because Shahid and I never really got to know each other and our paths crossed very briefly in a short but exceedingly eventful life. And yet, why am I glad to be here? Perhaps it is because that in the, in the angst-ridden and hyperventilating time that we find ourselves enmeshed in, we need to celebrate the ideas and ethos that Shahid represented, both as a playwright and as a critic. It was a vision that was generous, compassionate and poetic. And friends, this is the paper that I am going to be presenting to all of you today. It is titled, Is There Any Room Left for Poetry? Before I go any further, let me tell you that before I arrived here, I was warned, I was cautioned in, in Mumbai by lots of friends of mine. They say, what are you going to do over there? You know what is the place where you are? We are going to be a person, we are going Please be careful, please be cautious about what you say. You might provoke a lot of unnecessary responses. I just told all of them, I said, I'm just too old for that now. I have to go on. And so I've come here and I'm just too old to change my yes. lifestyle and my, <laughs> my attitude towards things. So let's get back to the subject of is there any room left for poetry? Now some people might ask whether this, there is a need to pose such a question. Especially now when we as a country find ourselves in an ominous confrontation with our neighbor. All I can say to them is that it is in fact in times like these that the need for introspection arises. I have seen and read enough in my life to realize that war very often is the easiest path to take if one needs to garner support for a political agenda. And there are too many instances in history that I can refer to that will bear me out. Wars can also be used to whip up I'm sorry, I'm a bit clumsy with these papers. We have incredibly bigoted and brutal emotions. And I refuse to be swept into this vortex of hate. I refuse to demonize the other. That's what the Germans did in the Second World War. That's what the Americans did in Vietnam and the French in Algeria. So what does that make me? I suppose I'm a pacifist. I can already see those trolls sharpening their knives to ever go at this parky loving unpatriotic bastard. Some might even add Muslim to the venom. But I have a message for those trolls. I love them too. And I would like to add that I love India as much as they do and I don't have to prove my credentials by being a hate monger. Besides, there's another secret I need to reveal. I never was a good Muslim and I never could be one because I was too much of an iconoclast to follow any rules and rituals. Let us say I was born free. But I must clarify certain things. With this anti-war stance, am I condoning acts of terror? I am not. Am I suggesting that there, shouldn't be a, there should be no response? I am not. All I know is that since the late 1980s, both sides have claimed to be victims of such acts. And if one looks objectively at the situation, it is true. It is absolutely true. The report that I have read on the death toll, human trauma and devastation on both sides is shocking. 
and I have seen too much in life to believe in the theory of good guys and bad guys. I leave that to the Americans. So what do we do? I say get together and talk. What are we afraid of? Peace? I believe peace can only be an ex existential threat to bigots on both sides of the divide. I must also add that my concerns about prevailing circumstances not just related to India and its environs, but also about a world that seems to be relentlessly heading towards confrontation. I also believe I would be doing a disservice to the memory of Shahid if I did not do so. Let me begin with this worldview. Is it really necessary? I don't know about other people, but I firmly believe that for an artist, ideas emerge, resonate, and find validity with a certain holistic understanding of the universe and mankind's role in that universe, a kind of cultural, political, and, and sociological underpinning that adds, that adds depth, texture, and meaning to a work of art. If that vision does not exist, all that emerges is fluff. In other words, much ado about nothing. I have taken some generous excerpts in my book, Memory in the Age of Amnesia, to reflect some of my concerns of what we have inherited. And strangely enough, I believe that Shahid and I would be in agreement with most of them. I began the book by asking a question. Why do I write? Is it because this is a messed up world that needs to be decoded? Perhaps. Is it because I'm also messed up, I'm messed up too, and I feel the need to unburden myself? Once again, perhaps. Or to combine the two uncertainties, is it because I'm messed up because we live in a messed up world which has a messed up economic and political system that cannot guarantee most of the people on the planet any assurance of a job, a decent education, affordable health care, or the shelter of a home? A system, in fact, that cannot guarantee anything. Perhaps that's the answer. An economic and political system that is unraveling and becoming dysfunctional. The net result is an alarming rise in inequality and anger, which has led to vicious sectarian and, and nationalist hysteria across the world as ordinary people try to make some sense of this state of affairs. This era of uncertainty has been exacerbated by the engineering of horrific wars that have left hundreds of thousands dead and created millions of refugees who are desperately trying to escape to safer futures. Many millions more economic migrants trying to reach land that can give them, give them some semblance of dignity. And then there are the secret, dirty wars that, are, that the imperial Western powers are waging for the control of vital resources in Africa and Latin America, specifically North Africa and Latin America. These wars don't make the headlines, but do create thousands of, of more refugees and a lot of militants as a consequence and a backlash. Yes, we are living in a world of social and economic upheaval. This, my friends, was the beginning of my book. I was talking about the conditions of the continents of Africa and Latin America. But how many of us know that, are the, that there are thousands upon thousands of illegal immigrant, Indian immigrants also trying desperately to reach other lands for what they believe are greener pastures? In fact, they can number into the millions. This story of desperation holds true for millions of other refugees from Myanmar, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Central Asia, Nepal, Philippines, and some other Far Eastern countries. Surprisingly, it has affected China too. Yes, Asia, Africa, and Latin America are the three continents hit the hardest and are reading from the effects of a collapsing economic order. However, the so-called developed countries have not been spared 
the raging onslaught of the economic system that they gave the world. Within the haloed world, specifically Europe and the USA, they have seen the rise of unemployment, slow growth rate, declining health care, rising inequality, rising frustration and street anger, high cost of living and the lack of affordable housing. In fact, a recent survey done in the US has revealed that 70% of the working people live from paycheck to paycheck with no possibility of saving. 70% in the United States of America. The land of milk and honey. The Occupy Wall Street movement that gathered momentum across the country reflect the people's anger against this state of affairs. The Yellow West movement in France is still raging. Does this sound like a developed world at all? In fact, economic conditions of government so skewed that a major trade war is looming on the horizon that can only make things worse. This is the incendiary mix of a social, political and economic system that we have inherited. It is in this mix that we have to unravel words like terror, patriotism, national interest and freedom. In our frantic and precarious times, these words are unleashed by multinational media houses that very often serve as echo chambers for powerful countries, corporations, or financial institutions. They often serve as a convenient camouflage to cover lust for power and control. And in this hysterical wordplay, the word democracy has been completely de devalued. The battle for the creative artist lies in giving it meaning once again. And what path and what road they take is left to them. Let me tell you a story about words and meanings. It's a story. There was an emperor of China who was incredibly worried. This is from my book, Ami, Related to a Democratic Mother. He was incredibly worried because things were going completely all right. Everything that he wanted to do for the country was going wrong and things were out of hand. There was chaos in the country. And he was extremely frustrated. And then his advisor came and rushed up to him and said, Sir, I've got a solution. He said, what is the solution? He says, the, 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 the philosopher Confucius arrived in our kingdom. Maybe he'll have an answer to our problems. So the emperor rushed to Confucius and dropped at his knees and said, Master, will you help us out? He said, what is the problem? He said, Master, no matter what we do, things are going wrong. We cannot solve our problems. Tell us why. Can you find the answer? He says, of course, I'll give you, give you some time. I'll try to. I'll travel around. I'll come back and give you an answer in a, in a month's time. So Confucius left and traveled across the land. And while the emperor fretted around, waiting for him, impatient for him to come back. And when Confucius came back, the emperor rushed up to him and said, Master, have you come back? I'm so glad you come back. Have you found the answer to the problem? He says, of course I've got the answer. He says, sir, what is, what, is, what is the answer to the problem? And he said, the words in your kingdom have lost their meaning. Language have been devalued completely. And that's why I'm talking about terror, patriotism, national interest. They've lost their meaning. Democracy. Who are we trying to fool? There is remember, something else that, that also disturbs me. How did the words democracy and freedom get linked to capitalism? I just need to ask this question, you know. How do you get linked to capitalism as an, as an economic system? Democracy is a social, political system. How did it get linked to an economic system called capitalism? It seems an incredible contradiction. The communists, in their zeal, tried to hijack these words too. But at least they were trying to achieve some kind of equality. Today, with capitalism holding center stage, the link has reached the level of, of an absurdity. It's absurd. All we have to do is look at the very rigorous documentation of Thomas Piketty in his book, Capital. It is here that the truth is revealed that we, as questioning citizens, always knew, but could not verify. That the number of poor is increasing, and also the real power lies in fewer and fewer hands. 
Does it sound democratic at all? And if the poor and middle class who happen to be the vast majority of the citizens on our planet have lost control over their lives and destiny, it doesn't sound like freedom either. Democracy and freedom. Wonderful words. Now both these words were used by George Bush. Not too young to remember this, but George Bush, the outgoing president of the United States, as he addressed the Iraqi and world media in Baghdad in 2003. He genuinely believed that the Iraq war had ended and that he had brought peace, freedom and democracy to the people after he had invaded their country. As Bush eloquently eulogized about the bright future ahead for both for Iraq and the world, in general, he got a shock. Instead of applause, what he got in return was a pair of shoes hurled at him in anger. They were flung at him by a gutsy Iraqi journalist who screamed and cursed him for the death and destruction that brought upon a weak and helpless country. This is for the thousands upon thousands of widows and orphans you have created, you dog, screamed the man as he was hauled away by security personnel. Bush recovered quite quickly from the onslaught, but he was terribly embarrassed. He thought the war was over and done with. In fact, it had actually just begun. It has still not ended till today. This war was and is a classic example of the arrogance of power that can be exercised unilaterally without, without anyone's permission. It had occurred without a UN sanction and without anyone else's permission, except for those of, those of a very powerful political lobby that steamrolled his point of view upon the world. What disturbed me personally was how most of the countries of the world shrugged their shoulders helplessly and moved on. It was clear they had no choice and the point was succinctly emphasized to them shut up and look the other way. That is what most of the world did. So where does power really lie? I believe this is intuition, conjecture. I don't know what, I have no data to back me up, but that's what I feel. What I feel, I will say. It is with an incredibly powerful group of bankers <coughs> who finance multinational cartels of oil, arms, finance, and pharmaceutical corporations, food and chemical corporations, global commodity manipulators, and other cartels that control international trade. And then there are the globally powerful think tanks. Don't forget the think tank. We have so many think tanks today in India. Sponsored by these worthies, whose job is to echo the needs of their, of their paymasters. And there's one grand and imperious idea that unites them all. They want control and power over the world and its resources. As my friend Rumi Costa said, to these people it does not matter whether the nation is democratic or not. It's so immaterial. What matters to this cartel is control over resources and the retention of power through either enforced stability or controlled chaos. The thought is disturbing. It is a kind of governance of the powerful for the powerful. <coughs> I will now return to another anecdote of Mr. Kundan Shah, my friend, passed away last year. So a year before last year, I forget. You know, he and I spent a lot of time together. We should discuss literature, poetry, music, cinema, politics, the world, over whiskey and regularly, you know, twice a month or something. In my house or his house or whatever. But we actually solved the problem of the world in our, over whiskey. And one day, he stopped me mid-sentence and said, just stop here. I want to show you something. Took me to the balcony. I said, let's look at the sky. Now, this is 11.30 in the night or something. I said, Kunda, what are you going to see in the sky? It's very dark here. What are you going to see? I said, look at the sky. 
So I said, oh, oh. I so looked up with him. So then as you were talking in the room, do you know what's happening over there? I said, what's happening over there? It was a movement of electronic money. Going from one money spot to another spot. <laughs> Digital, legitimate money, illegitimate money, traders, hucksters, carpetbaggers across the sky. And you think you and I run the world? <laughs> that runs the world. And that's why you had Janibi the Yarrow when he made that film at the end when they, they were hung. It was a great film, but at the end, both of them were strung up. Now, it's an attitude, perhaps defeatist. All of this leads to another question. Can ordinary citizens be brought back to center stage? I hope so. That gutsy Iraqi journalist will draw down on history. And though his act was a futile exercise of protest, <coughs> it mattered because it resonated with ordinary people around the world. I hope it still does. And I also believe that the role of the artist can be summed up in the quote by Milan Kundera, who said, the struggle of man against power is a struggle between memory and forgetting. I repeat that. The struggle of man against power is a struggle between memory and forgetting. Let us now examine conditions in our own land. Since I've taken on the world, let's come to our land. Where do we find ourselves today? Did we ever envision the kind of state of affairs in our country that exists today? Did we ever imagine that there would be so much discord, plural, polarization, contrary depends on a subject that we took for granted? To those people who seem surprised at this state of affairs, and there are a lot of people who are surprised by this state of affairs, let me ask them a question. How did they miss the signs? And there were many over the years that would lead up to a situation like this. <coughs> Did they not see the writing on the wall? To understand what I'm getting at, I have to jog our collective memories. For you people are very, but those who are slightly older, our collective memories a bit. So the, <clears throat> to the time when India became a republic with a written constitution. It was a time when our leaders defined their nation to ourselves, to both of the people of India, and to the world. We were sovereign and democratic with an underlying caveat of being secular. To me personally, this document was an act of courage. I say this because here was our country, this 1947. That is primarily feudal, caste and community ridden, that is born out of an incredible communal slaughter and the largest mass migration of people in history and yet had the courage to look at the, into the future with a sense of purpose and most importantly a sense of poetry. I couldn't believe it. 1947. And we had that vision. Despite. It was to be a multi-religious, pluralistic and inclusive nation that guaranteed all its citizens free speech, equal rights and opportunities. Lurking in the shadows, though much smaller in number, yet potent influence by other forces that were vehemently opposed to this ideal. They had a different agenda and a far simpler notion of what our country was all about, and to them, free speech, contrary to opinion, and equality for all was unacceptable. These were the two opposing grand ideas of what a nation could be or should be, and the battle was on. Within a short span of about 15 years, I must have been, uh, I know, after independence, I began to notice the slow dismantling of the institution that had made our country unique. It started with the creeping corruption in politics, the steady increase in communal rights, and the, a heightening of caste consolidations in the judiciary, bureaucracy, and the police. 
what followed for the next 30 years were a series of manufactured caste and communal riots that left the nation reeling. It almost seemed that these are people that were part of the laws of nature because no one was ever held responsible. Most political parties participated in this organized bloodletting for political advantage. And finally, added to this lethal mix were the linguistic and ethnic riots in the south and the northeast of the country and the rise of chauvinist and parochial forces in state after state. What was happening to our constitution at the period of time? The past 40 years you've seen it happen. And the last hammer blows at dismantling our shared heritage was the bloodletting after the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, the rise of the Kashmiri insurrection after the Bosch election of 1987 and the migration of Kashmiri Pandits, the slaughter and bomb blast after the destruction of the Babri Masjid and then the Godra tragedy. All these were recipes for disaster. And today, finally, there was only one ultimate winner to benefit from this manufactured cultural, social and religious divide. It didn't come swiftly. So don't try to be Alice in Wonderland. This is happening over time. And I was witness to those times. And I've recorded this time, I've documented this time, I've chronicled those times in all my work. And I am not Alice in Wonderland. Let me tell you two tears from a recent past. They are a, micro, a microcosm of a much larger mural, and yet they reveal so much. The first tale is about a, the savage riot and massacre that occurred in Mumbai after the demolition of the Babri Masjid. What follows is an excerpt from my book. More than 25 years have passed since those ghastly riots occurred in the city where I was born. As my own memory begins to fade, the only image, the image that remains in my mind is, a, is of an elderly milkman. He was on a bicycle and I tried furiously to pedal away to safety from a mob baying for his blood. The mob caught up with him and lynched him, then burnt his bicycle and trashed his milk cans. I often wonder about the, about the members of that mob. Later, did they feel ashamed of what they had done? How did they sleep that night? And then I think of the old man. Who was he? Where did he live? Did he have children, grandchildren? What was the dream that he had for them? On the day of his murder, did his children try to stop him from leaving home under such stressful circumstances? Did he have the choice of staying home for a few days till things calmed down? Did he not know how dangerous it was, dangerous it was to go to work as riotous mobs were rampaging on the streets, destroying everything that came into their path? Did he not know for an uncaring administration it did not matter whether he lived or died? And finally, did he not know he was a man of no consequence? The other great tragedy about the story of Frank Towns is when people today say it happened in the past, we have to move on. Move on to what I think. The second tale is a much more recent one. The story of a young Kashmiri Muslim, still in his teens, who decided to seek retribution for what he perceived to be a state of state oppression and humiliation. So he decided to videograph himself for his final act of revenge, where he, stand, stood before, where he stated that he was now on a holy war to redress all those wrongs. Standing in front of the camera the, with a bandana with the verse of the Quran on his forehead, he told the viewer that this was his final journey to achieve martyrdom. So he drove his car parked with explosives into a large convoy of trucks carrying Indian parliamentary troops in a place called Pulwana 
and blew himself up. The result was devastating. More than 40 soldiers died and many more were injured. The, the carnage was ghastly. We are all aware of the extreme outrage and anger that, that erupted and was expressed in every single platform available and the calls across our country for swift and comprehensive retaliation. In the incredible incendiary slogans raised, I was suddenly made aware of how far down the road we had traveled. There was no room for reflection. There was no room for pause. There was only bloodlust. And today, that bloodlust has paid off. The headlines have screamed and told us how we have crossed the LOC and pounded the living daylight out of the Pakistani group that claimed to be behind those terror attacks on the Indian troops. In the days and weeks ahead that will follow, there will be claim and counterclaim. Who did what to whom? There will be chest pumping and great speeches on valor, honor and reprisal. I find out sometimes the drum beats of hysteria will die down and then another reality will kick in. It is always there, that reality. But sidelined in the frenzied jingoism that temporarily engulfed our land. <coughs> what is this reality? Again, <coughs> excuse me, I come back to my first book called Ammi. Well, there was a paragraph on the kind of future that I was trying to envision. In fact, I also mentioned it today over here. Are we aware that every single year, I wrote that book in, two, in 2007, and I, this is a paragraph from there, and I found, it shocked me then that every single year, approximately 15 million young people enter the job market. 15 million young people who enter or want to enter the job market. They are either from the 10th, the 12th, or graduates across India every single year. And now calculate from 2008 till now how many million there would be. Where are the jobs for them? There aren't any. And not just that, it will become more and more difficult to find jobs. And all these young people have seen the good life on television, and they've seen the good life on our, in our film, and they've seen the good life in our, in, our, in our music video. They've seen the good life, generally speaking. And they're going to be very angry and frustrated. And that energy is there, waiting to be tapped and channelized. And who is going to tap and channelize these young people who by the time some they might become 30 year olds and 40 year olds, but the point is and they're going to be tapped. That energy is going to be tapped, I can guarantee you that. Who's going to tap it and how? And therefore what will be the social and political onslaught that can, that's going to be unleashed? What will our artist do in such circumstances? Is he or she prepared for the coming onslaught? And this day is in gentlemen is where we stand today. We are a nation divided. That is a fact whether we like it or not. I can talk to you about the forces of hate and bigotry. I can talk to you about the horrors of vigilantism. I can talk to you about the alarming rise in unemployment and the frustration of the young. I can talk to you about the quiet epidemic of farmer suicides. I can talk to you about the savage acts of terror and death and destruction that seem to occur regularly, or the shrill calls for targeted and punitive retribution. Rage and anger erupt at the slightest provocation. Any dissent or contrarian opinion is treated as sedition. The intellectual is treated as a subversive, and by any talk about dialogue is seen as a sign of weakness and against the national interest. And finally, I can also tell you about the targeted assault on the idea of India 
that was enshrined in our constitution. Friends and comrades, this is a very brief summary of the slow and painful journey we have taken to reach these scoundrel times. And our choices are very clear. You know it and I know it. What do, you want, what do we want our nation to be? What do we want our world to be? In other words, is there any room left for poetry? Or to put it another way, what role does the artist have to play in these searing times? Shah Anwar did his bit. He did his bit eloquently and with courage. Thank you.